Hi, I'm Jill Fehrenbacher, the Editor-in-Chief of Inhabitat.com, and I'm here today with Bianca Bosker. She's the Executive Tech Editor of the Huffington Post and new book author. She's just come out with this new book called Original Copies about Architectural Mimicry in China. Can you just tell me a little bit about what's going on in China? Where's this coming from? The book Original Copies is about this massive movement in duplitecture in China. And what that refers to is the copying of Western towns and cities. So if you go to China, you'll find that there are these enormous residential developments, some of which have been built to house hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and they copy Versailles, or they copy uh, Venice, or um, Amsterdam, or Orange County. You know, the architects and the planners behind these communities have gone to stunning lengths to ensure that the copies are very accurate and very literal. So in some cases, they'll even import materials from abroad to build them, or they'll hire architects from France to build the French development, or um, sometimes they'll even send people on location to, say, California to scout out what the copies in China should in turn look like. Um, but this is something that's happening throughout the country. It's happening again on, on a massive scale, and in some cases it's actually being funded by the government. What got you started writing this book? My interest in the topic started when I came across this One City, Nine Towns project in Shanghai, um, where these government officials decided to recreate um, 10 European cities all around the suburbs of Shanghai. And I wanted to understand why this was happening. I started reading up on it, and there'd been a lot written about the fact that um, China was copying this European town or that European town, but there wasn't a whole lot to explain why. What makes a country that has an incredible architectural history all its own, decide that it's going to borrow from abroad, and not only that, but from the past. The very important thing about this is that we're not talking about um, China copying the latest and greatest in architecture. Really, it's about copying um, very old historical templates, right? So I set out to figure out what was it about what was happening in contemporary China, what was it about Chinese culture, what were their attitudes toward copying uh, that gave rise to this trend. How is it impacting the people who are living in these spaces? It's, it's not only the architecture that's being replicated. There are elements of Western culture that are going along with the copycat. Um, so just as an example, Thames Town, which is this yield England look-alike in Shanghai, um, has more English eateries than you do Chinese places. Um, so you've got pubs, you've got wine shops, you've fish and got, chip shops. There, there was a fish and chip shop. I don't <laughs> think it ever opened. They had just copied the outside of it. Or in Tiandu Chung, which is a, a replica of Paris and Hangzhou, um, you have uh, this French culture week where um, Chinese residents or people from the town can come and they learn everything from how to actually chew on caviar to the difference between a bistro and a brasserie. So there is this effort to um, both live like the West and live in a place that looks like the West. They're, they're really fascinating landscapes. I mean, I think you walk into them and it really feels like you're leaving China entirely. I mean, they're quieter, they're much less dense, you know, beautiful gardens and plantings and manicured lawns, so of course very unsustainable, um, but uh, very beautiful. And the air even smells fresher, I think, than what you might find in, in other parts of urban China. And what type of people are moving into like Thames Town, for example? <laughs> A lot of people look at these communities and they think, oh, it's like Las Vegas. It's not at all like Las Vegas. These are residential communities. People are living here, they're raising children, they're cooking dinner. Um, so there's no tourist element to them. There, there is a little bit of a tourist element, okay. but not exclusively. And I think that's the sort of important difference there. But yeah, so, so that's a long way of saying that, yes, the people that are living here are Chinese. Um, the homes are being bought by people that are Chinese. These copycat communities are being built to appeal to homeowners at a range of different incomes. So you've got some that are cheaper, and then you've got some that are these huge, huge mansions with multiple kitchens, swimming pools. It's Chinese people, but it might be the um, obscenely wealthy or it might be the, the couple that's just buying their first home. Okay, so it's all strata of yeah, society. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes they've gone abroad and you know they know what it's like there. They come back to China and they want sort of that sort of lifestyle, but not necessarily. You also find um, people who haven't traveled extensively abroad, but they're very drawn to um, the Western uh, architecture. It is an important caveat to note that many of them have remained these empty ghost towns. They've been built and no one has come. 
Um, huh. So it's, it's a very bizarre feeling, especially when you go from downtown Shanghai where you can barely, you know, sort of fight your way through on a sidewalk um, to these places that are massive and totally empty. Weird, that's so weird. Yeah. In some cases, it has to do with the location. Um, some of them are, are you know, in, in areas of the suburb that don't have public transportation, they're hard to get to. Um, in some cases, they are actually completely sold out, but no one has moved in. So Why is that? The speculation. In some cases, okay. when the Shanghai government decided they would build these 10 cities, each styled after a European country, they actually tapped architects from each of those European countries to build them, right? So British architects for the British one, so on and so forth. And what those European architects sometimes didn't take into account was, what chi was how Chinese people lived and what they wanted out of their homes. So just as an example, um, when you go to these high-rise communities in, in China, you'll find that they're on, you know, there's parallel rows, right? You have you know, one after another just streets and they feel very rigid, but part of it is because people want their homes facing a certain direction. And on the other hand, these British towns had the curving, gentle streets that we might associate with um, sort of a medieval town in Europe. But then you get a lot of the homes that, according to the fun uh, principles of feng shui, are, are you know, facing entirely the wrong direction. So it's, they're very unlucky to live in. Huh. So then people don't want to buy them. Or there's one um, a Scandinavian themed town, for example. The doors were built completely wrong, so they didn't have the right symmetry. They, again, they were facing the wrong direction. Um, and the community, because they wanted to maintain the very European style, was adamant that no construction or alterations could be done. As a result, very few of the homes got sold and even fewer got moved into until they lifted that covenant and they let people start making changes to the homes. And now, um, when I was there, actually, they, almost every home had you know, these big uh, windows cut out of the sides where they were changing the orientation of the doors to make them more in accordance with Chinese traditions. That is so yeah. interesting. Yeah. What is inspiring this? Like, is this something within Chinese consumer culture where they really want replicas of Orange County? Yeah, I think the really important thing to keep in mind is that when China replicates, uh, say, Paris, it's not to pay homage to France. It's really a monument to China's own success. So what you're seeing is both on a personal and a national level, these copycats are really an effort to um, be testaments to China's technological prowess, its affluence, its power, and its achievements since this opening and reform period. Do you think there's a connection between um, architectural mimicry and like Louis Vuitton handbags? <laughs> I think the underlying principle is this idea of mimicry as a way of mastering something. This is a country, you know, that has, is going through one of the most rapid urbanizations in history. You've got this exploding demand for housing and, and real estate. And at the same time, China, for all of its very rich architectural tradition, had a bit of an architectural winter under Mao. You know, um, the cities sort of were not prioritized the way that um, the countryside was. Um, and, you know, real um, architectural experimentation and, and form was not encouraged. So, you know, at the same time that you had these real pressures to build, to expand, to grow cities, um, architects are still, I think, you know, trying to catch up very quickly to do that. And one way um, is, you know, let's copy and create it. And then I think the next for step of that might be really to, to innovate. Out of all these replicated monuments, communities, towns, which one is your favorite? So I think one of the experiences that resonates most with me was going to see a man in Shenzhen who had built a copy of the White House that he was living in. And he was so proud of it. I remember touring it with him and, and at some point he sort of stopped and just, you know, took a deep breath and he just looked at it and he said, you know, isn't this so beautiful? Wow. But, yeah. But I was just so struck because when a lot of people hear about this, um, they make fun of it. They, th they, they find it really distasteful. And I would just you know, encourage them, if they ever have the chance, to go to Shenzhen, talk to someone that, looks, that lives in a copy of the White House, and just see how much pride he takes in his home and how much it means to him, and, and just why that style resonated. Do, you, do you, um, Chinese architects and also Chinese consumers sort of understand the, like, the Western view of this? So there are definitely architects and uh, architectural critics in China 
who really are not wild about this trend. You know, they do see it as um, fake and authentic, kitschy. Um, what's really fascinating to me and what got me interested in this topic was that disconnect between um, how dismissive people in the West are towards these and the fact that people in China would spend um, you know, millions of dollars to build them or they spend their life savings to live in a place that looks like a fake Venice or um, a fake uh, Napa Valley. It's important to understand how differently um, people in China, I think, look at copying. In China, I think the, a copy has a much greater status. It can be a sign of, of mastery, of skill. It's a way of showing um, a real ability to do something well. Basically, like, they own it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it. okay. it's, that, it's, this, it's this figurative ability to really move Paris into their own domain and also to show that they can recreate the very best or most iconic architectural hits of Western culture. And I would actually suggest, well, what happens when China stops copying us? What does that mean, right? You know, we're at a point where um, Western architecture, the Western you know, landscapes and, and landmarks are seen as something very prized and something worth emulating. Um, do we get to a point where maybe we're not worth it anymore in the Chinese view. And maybe scarier. Yeah, and so maybe that might be scarier than, than seeing our best tourist destinations copied. Well, they say imitation's the sincerest form of flattery. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. This has been so fascinating. I had no idea about this. Thank you, this is great.